Hello everybody. I have been um, inundated with questions about the router plane and um, I've gathered together a few router planes here just to confuse you because um, there are so many different types and sizes, uh, homemades and manufactured, that it can be confusing. But in my view, you can get away with just one router plane and it might be a homemade one, it might be a vintage one, it might be a brand new one. They will all do what you want them to do. So we're going to discuss some of these issues that people have sent the questions in because I think they're very good questions. I've gone through them. We can't answer all the questions that you sent in because there were literally hundreds. But what we can do is take a group of them, um, the ones that are probably causing the greatest confusion or the most misunderstood or whatever. So I'm going to try and answer some of these questions for you. So the first one is from Dwayne in Manitoba, Canada. And he says, what wood do you recommend for making extension plate for the base of the router plane? How thick should it be? Well, there's one here that's uh, quite thick. Um, this is a borrowed one that I borrowed from Hannah. And hers is quite thick, but she has enough depth for the depth of the work that she's likely to do where the thickness of this isn't going to impair her. If the base is um, in the way and it's too thick, she can just take it off and just use it without the base. So it's not really an issue uh, for any of us, really. So we take the base off. But I've been using a wood called... Sapili. Um, the reason I'm using Sapili is because it's stable and once you've planed it flat and got it parallel um, it works perfectly long term and uh, it doesn't mark the other wood that's the important thing whereas you could use uh, some of the other woods the more oily woods um, will leave a mark on the surface of light hard woods so that's what you don't want so three eighths of an inch thick you can extend the length a little bit if you want to as I have with all of mine, I've given myself an extra two inches here. It's quite handy to have, especially when you're doing tenons. Uh, and usually about the same width as the footprint, or the same depth as the footprint. So I've got different planes here, but they don't usually go wider than the plane, as in the case of this one, or all of them. So it's appealing. But you can use just about any wood. I don't want you to think you couldn't use oak. You could use a variety of different, you can use maple. Uh, you can use a variety of different hardwoods. The hardwoods tend to work better and give you longevity, whereas the softer woods do tend to wear against the abrasion of the edge of a housing dado or something like that. So, but you can use pay, uh, pli um, pine in a, an emergency. If you're stuck on a job and you need something that gives you an extension, uh, then just go for a piece of pine. It will work fine. This is Bill from Georgia, and he said that recently... The floor of some elements I have chopped have been deeper than the Stanley router plane reaches. Is there a way to extend the depth of the reach? Um, there is an extension on the plane itself. On this particular plane, I've got this set with this uh, adjuster here. If I flip this over, I can change the depth. I can get added depth. I've got this on the maximum depth now. Uh, oh, no, on the shallowest depth. If I turn this over, this little bit gives me the extra that gives me an extra quarter of an inch deep. But on some planes, like this uh, um, record version, you get another eighth of an inch. You get more with this one. So if you flip this over, you can get the extra depth. If you want to go very deep beyond the extension of this uh, adjuster uh, rod and everything, uh, it's really to do with the length of the cutter itself. I don't think there's a way of going deeper and generally it doesn't work too well because when you're routing it out there's a tendency with that extra leverage on the, on the length of the, uh, the cutter to trip the plane as it goes across the wood or in the recess. So probably, yeah, you are limited really. Uh, Pete from Yorkshire. Having just bought my first router plane, I was wondering what basic maintenance should I do to restore it to good working to a good working tool. He's bought his first router plane uh, and he wants maintenance, but he's actually talking about two different things here. He's talking about restoration and maintenance, the two distinctly different areas. Basically, if they come and they're full of paint and rust and maybe some uh, brick dust mixed in there with some concrete, you just have to get all that off. So if you took the plane and uh, trued up the sole, got it as flat as you could, and then just break the edges all the way around with a file or some abrasive paper, 
that will usually do it. Oil the components, clean off any rust that's got into the um, moving parts, the components, the threads and so on, and then sharpen it. So it's, um, it's going to be up to you, really, how much work you want to put into it. And uh, this is from Fluid, Staffordshire. What is the best way to set the... Did you notice the way I said fluid? That's the Welsh pronunciation of fluid. Uh, so, uh, what is the best way to set the height to make sure you don't plane too deeply? Boom. boom. Do you recommend attaching a wooden support screwed to the base of the plane? So, two separate questions. What is the best way to set the height to make sure you don't set the plane too deeply? There's a variety of different ways. You can simply measure it with a rule. Uh, you can, um, if you were to establish a depth of, let me see if I can show you more readily, this one here, for instance. If I set this with a rule, I can just measure from the sole to the cutting edge, get the 3 8 depth that I need, or I can take the rule and a knife, set the blade to the 3 8 deep that I need and make a mark here, and then I can set the cutter to that depth. So I just then simply wind, dial in the depth that I want as best I can. And then once I've got that depth, then I've got the depth that I need. So you can do a couple of ways. If you have something that already gives you an existing depth, like this one for instance, say I want this depth in this groove here, in this recess here, I would set this down dial it in again till I get the right depth so it's not rocking, set it and then go to this one and I've got the depth that I want to route that one to. So those are a couple of ways that are practical. Do you recommend attaching a wooden support screwed to the base of the plane? I do for most things. Wherever you have metal approaching wood there is usually a marring to the surface no matter how smooth uh, or well made the plane is, it seems to always be able to mar the surface, especially on softer woods. So whereas wood on wood very, very rarely does. So I would say definitely have a, a plate attached to it, wooden plate, not metal. Uh, and I think then you can always take it off if you need to for whatever reason. Okay, now the next questions are using the router plane. This is from John in Utah, USA. My Veritas router plane changes depth during the cut. Boom, boom, that's a question. The shank of the iron slips in the collar. Is there a trick that will prevent the slippage and help ensure an equal depth across the entire surface? Some planes do that. And if you look at the Lee Nielsen plane, they've got this little trick piece here that slides up and down. And when you, lie, when you pull this down, lock it off, you've got this one locked off too it won't move, it'll stop it from going deeper, which is what you want. It, it's, if it goes shallower, if it pushes up because of the pressure, then you just have to push it back down. But once you've locked this stop off, then you're fine with it. And Veritas has done the same thing on theirs. They've got a, an adjuster here that locks off as well. And um, it's a good addition. The thing is, I've noticed, I've never come across a router plane that uh, it didn't shift. It's just that you're exerting so much pressure on the router very often that it tends to do that. And it can be that you've got a, an angle to the grain that you're routing that is commensurate with the bevel of the blade. So when you're routing, it tends to pull the blade into the surface of the wood as you exert that forward momentum. And that's when it starts to go pear-shaped because then you're actually routing and you can be routing before you realize you've gone another sixteenth deeper than you wanted to usually when it's critical so um, yeah it, it's there is no trick really to preventing the slippage if it doesn't have those lock off uh, collars on there except to really cinch everything as tightly as your fingers can go often I think the very best ones are the the thumb screw variety because you can get a lot of pressure on there and if you want to you could even use uh, something that will give you added pressure so the thumb screws are definitely definitely the better rather than 
the knurled nuts that we have on, on some of the planes that engineers think we need that are better, but very often are not better at all. So definitely the thumb screws win for me. Uh, this is Ed in Canada. How does one prevent tear out when routing? Tear out, There's, there are a lot of um, reasons that wood will tear out. Um, one can be that we just go into this, this thing bulldoggedly and we, we put the router to the task and then we, and we're just bulldogging this. We're not really at all sensitive to the surface of the wood. Whereas we should be using this more like this and feeling for the grain like we would with a paring chisel and altering the corner of the, the, um, the router blade into the wood and even turning the, the router around and working it from the other side. So now it's not tearing for me and I'm feeling for that grain and I've not got the torn surface on this section and you'll, you'll see. So I just did the bottom half of this is as smooth as silk when I was coming from this side and just bulldogging into this. It was just tear, tear, tear. The other thing is not to take off too much wood. Often we want to take something down a sixteenth of an inch. It's too much. We should only be looking at somewhere around 30, a thirty-second of an inch or even less, much less in some cases. So it's more becoming sensitive to the grain, the grain type of the wood, the tool, making sure the edge tool is pristinely sharpened those kind of things, making sure we've got the right depth of cut so we're not taking too much off. And it's less about um, bruising and being forceful uh, than it is about being sensitive and using this as you would a chisel, feeling for that edge, feeling for the corner, the optimum cutting edge, and working through the surface that way. Uh, Darrell Carson, Sprague River, Oregon, USA. One thing I've noticed by watching your videos, Paul, is that the only you, that you only use the router plane to put the finishing touches on tenon cheeks, dados, and the like. Was the router plane designed for more than this, or is this where the router shines? The router plane really was designed for you, you can either you can either completely use the router plane. Uh, and in that case, if I was routing this depth out here, I've got quarter of an inch to go down. I might take a 30 second off at a time. So I set my depth of my router to 1 30 second, route out the midsection, then alter it again another 30 second and go down incrementally. And then for the very final throws, I would probably set it at a 64th of an inch and just skim that surface off to get this pristine uh, Bottom out, uh, bottom out in the in the finished cut. So, I use it on the the tenon. As far as I know, I've never I never saw anybody else use a router to trim a tenon or even to form a tenon. And we've got some amazing videos on how to tenon using a router and get the pristine results that you need. Uh, so I've focused on the router plane because when I first started to write about the router plane, everybody thought it was a router that you could cut. Uh, molds with like you might use a power router but the power router of course was the adaptation uh, making it useful for making molds onto wood whereas this this router will never put molds on wood that's not what its intention was it's purely for routing out the bottoms of recesses so it could be a dado a housing dado like this it can be a an enclosed recess on all four sides you can use it for inlay work that type of thing and also you can use it for sprucing, getting a pristine surface with a guaranteed um, parallelity to the outside face of say a rail, uh, you can use it for that. It's a perfect tool for that. It's, and actually, when we started blogging on this, you could buy this plane on eBay for about nine pounds. And since I started writing and telling people, no, it's got much more to it than this. You can't just use it for routing out a dado. Use it for this and this and this. And then people started loving this plane and now the this plane or this one will sell for a hundred pounds it's gone up and up and up and then some of the more rare versions like this one will sell for four and five hundred pounds so these are very rare but i just introduced a few uh, oops a few planes here just to show you the variance but you only need one probably
Okay. All right, this is Dave Pawson in Cambridgeshire, I think. Uh, grain issues, cutting out the channel, tenon. I often dig in, no, not taking big cuts, likely due to the grain. You've mentioned feeling for the grain with the number four plane. How do you address this with the router plane, please? Let me flip this over and see if I can give you a little bit of insight with a router plane. So if I set this plane to near flush to the surface, so it's taking nothing off now, it's just taking off a little bit. So there the grain is tearing it in the surface. So what I am doing, I've got torn grain, I can see the surface is tearing and, and what I want to do is really what I just did a few minutes ago is come in from the other side and I just work my plane this way and then I'll work the corner of the blade like this and then I'll do a skew cut like this and what I end up with is these pairing cuts and this is as smooth as silk so I'm using the corner of the blade but I, my initial response is to this and suddenly where I am on the soft element of this uh, growth ring suddenly I've hit this darker color here that's the harder element of the growth ring so when we look on the end here the dark part is harder than that soft part I sense that when it hits that surface and I stop, I don't try and force it. So when I get to that hard point there, then I come in and I work the grain with the point at the corner of the blade and I get through it. So now what I've got is I've got this super smooth across this whole surface by simply using the corner of the blade. So I, I use this instrument, which is what it is, to tell me what's going on with the wood. And then I alter my attitude towards it. I alter the presentation of the blade to it, use the corner and I work through it. So we've got this beautiful smooth surface. Now inside the bottom of a dado, perhaps that doesn't matter so much. You don't have to be so pernickety about it. But when it's on the surface or in here where I might only be going a 30 second deep where I can add a veneer in there, it might be more important. So it's always important. Always remember, it's not what you make that's important, it's how you make it. And that's going to determine the outcome. So that's what I have advocated for so long. This is Mick from Hilversum in NL. So I don't know where NL, whether that's the Netherlands or somewhere else in the world. Paul, the main issue I have been using, I have when using a router is that the shavings end up between the sole of the plane and my workpiece. This shaving scars the wood. How to prevent this? Okay, I've got you on this one. And um, this is where sometimes you're, uh, there's a couple of places here. If you are routing out the bottom of a dado, um, you have to constantly be altering. So I'm routing here and um, I've got to constantly, I'm routing out here, I've got to be constantly aware that if I do this without that wooden sole on, let's take this one for instance, here. So if we set this plane, oops, not quite what I wanted. If we set this plane, and um, now this is just a vintage plane that's never been sharpened, so bear with me just for a second. So if I'm routing here, and I'm routing out the, the base of this dado here, these particles come onto the surface, they spring onto the, onto the surface. They weren't there before I started, so I'm routing here, and I pull, and then I, I skip up, and I pull back on the surface. This is between the undersole. You just have to be constantly aware. It's this sensitivity thing. Again, we keep working the surface, we feel something jarring. We've got these little pieces. It's constant blowing the whole time. But there is another element to this. If I take this plane and I set this to the depth, like here, 
and I'm routing out a stopped housing dado like this one, like that. This wood inside here, let's put some of this inside here. This wood in here can come to the fore edge like this wood is here and when I keep pushing that wood and I'm routing the whole time so if I go deeper now and create this problem this is now at the four part of here so I hit that and it's damaging that four part that's the problem this was the problem with this type of plane this is a record number 71 and a half this was the alternative to this one you can see on my left, it's got the hump in the middle. On the right, it's just a flat sole all the way across. So when you're routing with this fellow here, you hit this with the four part, it's damaging that open edge there. And, uh, and we have a problem because this piece of wood is going to be seen later. This was where Stanley came in and invented the hump. So we don't have that issue unless, as we mostly do, we add the wooden sole. Then we eliminate the benefits of this and we end up with the wooden sole again. But if that is the case, if you are routing there, just give it a blow and you're back in action. So it's just a question of being conscious of that. Okay. Hi Paul, this is from Brian McGregor in uh, Valdivia, Chile. I probably I'm not pronouncing that right. Hi Paul, is the router plane effective for making a groove with the width of the iron or the rebate as you do with the plow plane? Thank you. It, it is and it isn't really. The, uh, the router plane is not intended for plowing a groove. They're not two inter it's not an interchangeable plane. Uh, whereas I, you can do it and you can take the um, marking gauge, you could saw down the sides of the Groove, um, a quick, quick example. So if we were wanted, say, a groove in here, like this and this, you can take the saw and saw down the length of the side walls. But what we're really doing here is we're adapting these tools. These are not what they were intended for. So all we're doing in actuality, I'll guarantee that nobody at Record or Stanley envisaged anybody doing something this, uh, like this. Let's see if we can take. So we take out some midsection like this. We don't have a guaranteed depth. So we take a plane that has a narrow enough plane iron in it like this one and we can now set this. So this is adaptation, not intent. And we can take this now and run that down the groove. So this is just Paul getting on his um, ideas level. So we can take that out and we can use it that way, but it's not intended for a guaranteed uh, surface. The other planes you can do that with, you can do that with this one, but then you say, well, doesn't this drop over? And it does, but they have an adapter in here that goes in a stem on the fore part of the plane, levels off on this surface with the underside of the sole, and so you can use it for that as well, because there are places where we do such things, such as the plight of the woodworker. Going on to what works better, Liam, New Jersey. Is it important to get a router plane with a micro adjust heat, a height wheel for that extra precision or will a model without the adjustment wheel do the job just as fine? Thanks, Paul. This is what I call a pinch type and this is where you, it could be a homemade one like this. This is one I made out of an Allen key or an Allen wrench. Uh, and this is where you pinch it up and down, lock it off at the back with just a thumb screw threaded into the wood, or it, it could be this type here that's a bit more to it, um, and you can adjust your height, and you just pinch it. When you've got near to depth, you slacken off, and you just pinch it, and you can adjust it, you know, by a thousandth or whatever. Uh, Veritas even makes this one, this is their version of it, and this one again, you slacken off and you pinch, and you can lower or heighten that blade 
This one is very good because it has a spring-loaded washer in here that keeps pressure applied to the blade. So even when you slacken this off half a turn, it's movable, but it's locked. It's also uh, arrested in a certain pressure, under a certain pressure. So I would say, no, you can go both ways. And the reason I say that is because I have yet to find, even with the modern makers, uh, where the, um, uh, the blade is arrested at a certain height and it doesn't move, even after when you're locking it off, sometimes you have set the depth, you lock this off and you go back and it's changed the depth. Uh, so often we're adjusting this and sometimes it doesn't move at all and there's no rhyme or reason for it not to move. There's fairly tight tolerances and so on. For some reason they just don't move. So it's really an engineering trick to get that just right, but none of them, nobody has got it. I haven't found a single manufacturer that did it successfully. Justin Massome of Washington DC, uh, are there specific times when you would reach for a router plane over a plow plane and vice versa? The plow planes are generally not, I'm not saying exclusively, but generally they're intended for cutting along the grain or with the grain. So that means the, the, that would be going along this way. And, and I think that that's important to recognize the plow plane cuts grooves going with the grain, not across the grain generally. Now you can adapt them to go across the grain, but that's generally not what we do. The router plane is generally for cutting across the grain. So we're going across this way. And, and that's important because we've somehow we've severed the walls and we've gone across the grain. The plow plane doesn't cross grain cut because it's cutting with the grain. The, the blade itself, because it's commensurate to the direction of the grain, so the grain is running this way, you don't need to sever across the grain. But with a, a, a housing dado or any cross, any um, uh, housing cut, you always have elements that are across the grain. So you have to cut those walls, whether it's with a knife, a chisel, or um, a, a saw, or whatever, you have to cross grain cut. So it's intended for a cross grain cut. So they're two dedicated planes, really. But I did show a little while ago that you can if you need to adapt them to do different things. And that's just a question of adaptation. This one is from Greg, but he's from Georgia in the USA, and Matt Newman, Minnesota, Johan Washington, Gordon Clark, Vancouver. You're basically asking the same question. Diamond point versus the uh, square uh, blade. So we've got a diamond point like this one. This is a plain blade that's used for, you can use it in the plow plane, in the um, router plane, and you can use each side to run along the surface of a, of a groove like this and this by just skewing the plane so you get right into the corners, right into the edges, and this is really a leveling tool. It was designed to level the bottom and perfect the bottom of a groove. It doesn't work, as, in my opinion, I haven't really found it works any better than the square cutter if it's well sharpened and been trued up according to the patterns that I've given for truing up the blade to the plane itself. So everybody's asked the same question about the diamond point and then the other bit was um, preparing the wood for the sole. All you need to do is make sure there's no twist in the board that you're doing. So you plane it out of twist by using winding sticks on one side run a marking gauge all the way around and plane the next surface parallel to it. Use a vernier if need be to get the kind of accuracy you want, but it is important to get it perfect, and that's all you need. I've really enjoyed the questions, everybody, and I don't want you to ignore this. I'm not, this is not a hard sell, this is just me. I've written about 30 pages just on the router plane alone, and it includes everything you need to adjust it, alternative uses for it. It's a wonderful... Um, this is where I put all my original thoughts from my working with the router plane, but with a, you know, a few other tools in there too that I consider essential. So this is my book, I wrote it three years ago, and it's been a great book, it's been a good resource for everybody. So you can go to my blog, you'll find more information there, drawings, pictures, photographs of router work, uh, but this, we're talking about the hand router, not the power router, remember. So 
this is where the real hand power is, is in hand tools. And that's what I advocate for most woodworkers. I think that's what they're really looking for. So thank you for listening to this. I've enjoyed doing it, enjoyed pulling it together. The router is an amazing tool. Thank you.